today we have two topics for our webinar. Number one, uh, the topic is the ways to start moving to cloud storage for free. The second one is how to present your business online uh, effectively. Uh, many businesses are already uh, disrupted uh, even before the pandemic, right? So I remembered uh, disruption was the buzzword before the pandemic, but now a new phrase seemed to be emerged. Uh, do you know what is that? If you can just give me uh, some response in the chat. Um, before the, before the, the uh, pandemic, the word for businesses is always disruption, disruption, you know, uh, business will disrupt you. But there is a new uh, phrase now that people use and it's always on the news. Even the prime minister use it, the radio uses it. Um, so you know what's the phrase, everybody? Okay, okay, let me let you in. Eh? So uh, the, the phrase now is called the new normal. Uh, previously, we used to tell businesses that uh, you have to disrupt before you get disrupted now, right? But now, uh, all businesses have to embrace the new normal. Um, so everybody's using now. Sometimes I think it's overused, but it is true. Uh, because of this pandemic, we have to function differently. And how do we do that, right? Um, so regardless of that, uh, both these phenomena, um, disruption and uh, new normal, requires transformation. Um, people say every problem provides an, uh, provides an opportunity, right? So if the pandemic is a problem, there must be an opportunity somewhere. For example, so many people became overnight chefs, correct? How many of you became overnight chefs? Suddenly everybody knows how to cook. So the question is, are we fast enough to transform? So that leads us to our topic of discussion today. And that gives me an honor to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Frank uh, Peter is a subject matter expert in various fields of digital marketing, including online advertising, social media marketing, digital data-driven decision-making, as well as digital transformation, uh, focusing on HR and small to medium-sized companies. Um, Dr. Frank has um, helped many companies to get better understanding of what digital means for the organization and how it can benefit their overall business processes. His style has been described as in-depth yet entertaining. Um, Frank is the author of Digital Marketing, Tactics for Decision Making, which is also available on Amazon. And he's currently uh, working on his new book entitled Digital Transformation for HR Leaders. So we can't wait to see his new book come out. Um, Dr. Frank has been conducting corporate training and has uh, spoken extensively at, at international conferences and corporate events for over 15 years. His clients list uh, both many well-known companies across Asia Pacific and Middle East, including Astro, Asiata, Cellcom, uh, Domino's, Genting Resorts World, GNC, Intercontinental Hotel Group, Petronas, and many more. Well, if I have more time, I will go on and on, but uh, this is just a quarter of his biography. So um, we, we, will, we, will know more, we will know Frank a bit more. So uh, Frank, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So as you Welcome. can see, I switched camera, so I look, I look slightly different. Um, yeah, welcome. Uh, welcome again to uh, all of you. I'm glad to be with you remotely uh, with really proper social distancing um, over many kilometers. Uh, this is going to be, as Dr. T pointed out, the new normal. So the classroom training face-to-face -face is not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, quite a number of my clients have contacted me to change uh, arrangements that we had in the past. Uh, the arrangements were made in the past for training in the future uh, to move this into uh, the online world. So that's that's how it's going to be. Uh, so most likely some universities will also move into this because uh, of no choice. Uh, that also gives then an opportunity uh, for small and medium-sized businesses. Now, at the moment, uh, many businesses struggle uh, because they have, especially those who have done stuff uh, the old way. 
What I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about today is really from um, the perspective of uh, small and medium enterprises or small and medium businesses, uh, the struggles that they have in adapting to the new normal and some tips, uh, you know this is two parts, right? Today are some tips on uh, cloud computing, the benefits of it, what it is actually, uh, the benefits of it and why uh, businesses should go into it and you can do so for free. And the second part today will be on um, yeah, getting your business online. That's another thing. So if, you are, if your business is purely brick and mortar, uh, during, during MCO, nobody's going to go there, obviously. So you have no choice but uh, to uh, visit uh, online presences at this moment. On Monday, we have the second session. Uh, and I will talk about some other things, uh, about social media, I think. I will talk. Uh, so using social media for branding purposes or uh, marketing purposes and uh, something else which I can't remember. Anyway, uh, so today we will look into uh, going forward with uh, the digital transformation part. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Otherwise I can't see my screen. Um, so digital transformation for SMEs in a time of crisis, that's the official title for it. And the first part we're going to talk about will be uh, the cloud computing part. A brief introduction uh, as to who you're dealing with. Uh, so as you already pointed out, my name is Frank. Uh, he already introduced me quite substantially, so I don't have to go too much into it. But you can look up with me on uh, LinkedIn. As you can see, there's a, li uh, there's a link there, linkedin.com. And let's look for my name there. Or you can uh, visit my website. The website is shown uh, further there at the bottom. Now, uh, on that website and that link that you see there, you will also be able to get the slides. So it's drfrankpeter.com slash SME. If you scroll down, uh, you will be able to get the slides that you'll uh, be seeing here today. Don't do it now. Uh, do it after the talk. Now you got to listen to me. Um, but no, it's, it's on the website and free for you to pick. So what we're going to do first is I want to just clarify a few definitions. Uh, stuff that has been going on left and right uh, about different buzzwords where, uh, that many people use, but uh, that are quite often not used correctly. So those are digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. Most of these words have been used uh, quite um, interchangeably, but they're actually quite different from one another. Now, digitization uh, is the process of converting something from an analog state to a digital state. What that means is that, uh, let's say you have a, uh, you write a letter, a handwritten letter uh, with a pen on a piece of paper, uh, and you convert and you scan this letter uh, using a scanner, or you take an image of that scanner, uh, of that letter with your, with your camera, uh, that converts the analog letter into a digital format, then you can send it with a digital way. So the conversion of analog stuff, analog files, filing cabinet stuff, into a digital format with a scanner, let's say converting it into a PDF document, that is digitization. And that's normally the first step in an overall transformation process from a technology point of view. Uh, the second word is digitalization. Uh, and that is the conversion of processes. So it is not the actual physical conversion of an analog document into a, physical, uh, into a digital document, but it is the conversion of processes, analog processes into digital processes. Um, a good example of that is now once you wrote your, uh, your letter, your handwritten letter, in the old days you would put it into an envelope, put a stamp on it, put it to a mailbox, and then the mail system will deliver it over a few days, hopefully, on snail mail. That's an analog process. Uh, nowadays, you can scan that letter, means you digitize your letter, uh, you attach it to an email, and you send it via email. That is the digital process. So the conversion or the transformation from analog processes to digital processes, that's referred to as digitalization. And digital transformation is the overall sort of family name for it, the bird's eye view. So that is mostly for companies, but also for personal lives where you uh, change both um, processes as well as documents or uh, analog things into digital things, uh, do it for, uh, on, on a bigger scale. So that is basically, in a nutshell, digital transformation. Let's want to get this out of the, um, out of the way. Um, the first part we're looking at when it comes to cloud computing is really initially the digitization and then the digitalization as well. 
So let's get into it uh, for cloud computing. So what is the cloud? Many people use the word, nobody really can define it. And that's exactly what the cloud is. And it's very difficult to define. Uh, let me give you an example. So for, for SMEs, for example, or for small businesses, uh, there was a time I had uh, staff, I had six staff at some point, and we all had uh, desktop computers in front of us. We were sitting in one office, one room, with partitions, very boring, uh, but everybody had a desktop computer. And all these computers were not connected to one another. So if I wanted to get a file from one of my colleagues, I had to go to that person's desk, uh, and ask them, can you email me that file? If it's a small file, if it's a bigger file, I will take a little thumb drive, I'll walk over and have that person put that file on the thumb drive, then I walk back to my desk, uh, put it into my computer, stick it in my computer, and uh, retrieve the image or whatever file I have from that thumb drive. That is a very tedious process. So maybe that takes me 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes for me, 10 minutes for the other person who load, to load the file on it, so that's 20 wasted minutes for basically non-productive work. So that's how it was in the old days. Uh, nowadays, it is very different. Uh, now you can easily share stuff. And that's what, what makes the cloud possible. So for the cloud, uh, instead of sharing stuff on your computer, you share it on uh, something that is a bit less defined, but something that is accessible to everybody anywhere in the world. Now, uh, in the olden days, now for storage, for example, I could point at a uh, server. So if you were to come to my office and say, now, Frank, where is that file? Uh, I can point at my computer and say, it's in there somewhere. Uh, now, with cloud computing, I cannot. I can only tell you the file is somewhere. Uh, so cloud computing is uh, basically a storage. For most of it, it's basically a storage that is outside the physical computer in your own premises. So you can store stuff uh, wherever you want uh, in the cloud, how much you want, uh, but it is not inside your office. Uh, there are quite a number of pros and cons for it. Uh, they're mostly Myself by mistake. Um, so this is this is just the definition of uh, cloud computing uh, based on Wikipedia. So there, there are two things in there that that are particularly important. One is uh, it's mostly data storage and computing power, but it is decentralized. So it is not no longer in a particular location, but it is decentralized someplace else. Uh, the other thing is that uh, it is available to many users uh, anywhere in the world as long as they have internet. Let me go into a bit more details when we go when we talk about the pros and cons of it. So that's basically what it is. So that's what I mentioned. So uh, the cloud computing allows you to move away from uh, files in your computer and make those files accessible to everybody in the world. Let me give you another example for this, just to point this out. So, um, which is particularly important to the MCO right now. So if you have, if you run a company or a small business and all of your files uh, in those ugly steel cabinets that you can see on that screen. Uh, it is very difficult for you to do any work right now because nobody is allowed to go to the office. So if your work requires to uh, pull out certain files, uh, whatever, do something with it and put them back, uh, that work cannot be done. Uh, it is also very difficult if uh, the content of certain files needs to be shared uh, between different colleagues. Uh, if you have that file on your desk, then your colleague is screwed because no longer there. If the colleague doesn't know where that file is, uh, then he or she can't do the work. But that is a bit of a problem. Uh, whereas in the clouds, if your files are uh, moved into the cloud and available uh, through the cloud, then uh, the files can be shared with anybody who ever wants them. So an example of that is if you go to my website later on after this uh, after the seminar today, uh, the website that you see below, you scroll down, uh, you can download these slides. These slides are currently hosted in the cloud. So regardless of where you are in the world, you could download these slides to your computer at any time of the day, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. So you don't have to email me and ask me, now, Frank, can you send me the slides? It is available based on data sharing. 
selected sharing. So some pros and cons. Uh, one of the big advantages uh, of cloud computing is you don't have to buy your own server rack. So in the olden days, uh, when uh, businesses set up, uh, they wanted to have an IT infrastructure, they had to have uh, big, uh, big servers uh, that will connect all the computers in the building, or at least in the office. Uh, that was huge capital expenditure. Uh, you had to buy not only the hardware, but also the software. So you had to buy a license for Microsoft Windows. Uh, you had to buy a license for Microsoft Office one for each computer often, and that's a lot of money that has to come up. Uh, with cloud computing, you don't have that, that problem. Uh, the infrastructure, so all the, uh, the cloud computing servers, they are in data centers all over the world, anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, you don't have to pay for it to set it up. That's already there. Uh, the other thing is management. So if you have uh, your own computers uh, in your building, your own server, you need to have IT personnel that handles them. So they do their software update, not having anything breaks. So they have to be there uh, by right 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that is also manpower intensive. Uh, so that, that, costs, uh, that costs money as well. For cloud computing, you don't have to do this. The providers for cloud computing will, all do, will do all this stuff uh, on your behalf. So you don't have to bother. You just, all you need is uh, a device that is internet connected. That's all there is. So it can be a computer, it can be a desktop, it can be a smartphone, it can be a tablet, or anything else, a game console, doesn't really matter. Uh, brings me to the second point, the accessibility and sharing data. That's really uh, the, the main bonus uh, for, for, from the user point of view. Uh, any file that is stored on the cloud is accessible to anybody in the world if you if you uh, put the sharing rights for a property, it's accessible to anybody in the world uh, who, who is interested in this, or it's accessible to only people that you as the file owner allow. Uh, the, the slides that are available on my, uh, in my cloud storage, uh, they are available to anybody in the world. But I could make it uh, that I only allow, let's say, Dr. T to download the slides and nobody else. So permissions can be set as you require um, that allows you to either selectively share data or uh, share it with anybody in the world. So a website is sharing data to anybody in the world without any restrictions. Basically. Uh, cloud storage is highly reliable uh, because the vendors, uh, Am uh, like Amazon, for example, or Google, uh, they put a lot of effort into always updating both their software uh, as well, as you can see the last point, but also the hardware. Uh, so the downtime is minimum. Whereas uh, in your, if you have a computer in your office, uh, the power goes out or there's a fire, even worse. Uh, but even the power goes out, then uh, the data are no longer uh, accessible. Whereas for cloud storage, the data are still there. So you could move with the tablet to some area where you have access or use a battery backup on your phone uh, and then can still continue. With your work. Uh, cloud providers also duplicate your content. So in case, in worst case scenario, now one of the data centers burns down for whatever reason, your data is gonna be duplicated in a few other data centers as well. So there's uh, the chance of you losing your data is remote to almost impossible. Uh, that's in contrast to if you have a fire in your own computer room, if that burns down, you're screwed, all is gone. And the last part I mentioned that is the automatic software update. So you don't have to buy any patches, you don't have to hire anybody to set those in. Uh, it all can be done automatically. So cloud computing is very, very helpful. Uh, the disadvantage and the main disadvantage from the Malaysian point of standpoint, uh, stand, uh, point of stand, is it requires uh, obviously internet access. So if you have lousy or slow internet access, then cloud computing is gonna be slow. Uh, what happens in cloud computing is that uh, all the, the work that is being done uh, normally on your computer, like word processing and other stuff, um, is also done in the cloud. Uh, so that normally is a lot faster than doing it on your, uh, on your, office, uh, in, on your office desk, but uh, it will help. Uh, it, it's it's gonna be difficult to do if your bandwidth is limited and if the internet speed is limited. Uh, there are some ongoing costs. Uh, can you please uh, mute yourself? Uh, you can click on the bottom left uh, on your screen, there's a microphone. If you can click on that to unmute, uh, sorry, to mute yourself for those who have not done this. Uh, otherwise, not a moment. That's how, that's how Zoom works. Uh, the person who is the loudest will get the screen. 
So if somebody else now would have uh, would be unmuted and uh, say something, it would override me saying something. So that's why there's a switch uh, in, in the images. So the best would be to, uh, if you could, just to, un uh, to mute yourself for a time being, and later on when we have a discussion, you can go. Uh, yeah, for those of you, yeah, yeah. For those of you who, who have your microphone on, if you can just mute it now, there is a button on the left uh, bottom. Left bottom, yes. Uh, I think that that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So that that was an example of Dr. T overriding me, uh, but now I'm I'm talking louder, so I uh, I get the screen again. Now, for cloud computing, uh, there is no initial setup cost, generally. Uh, I'll show you in a moment uh, an easy way of doing that, or using Google Drive, uh, but there are potentially ongoing costs. So if you scale this up uh, to become very big, then there will be monthly subscription fees or pay-as-you-go fees. I'm going to talk about this in a second. Now, security, I put this under cons. Uh, if not, if, because some people bring this up, they say, no, if my... Um, if my files are on my computer, I'm safe, but if they are somewhere on some other data center, in some, other, some other parts of the world, uh, people can hack into it. And that's not really true. I mean, there's a remote possibility, but these vendors that have the cloud storage, like Google or Amazon, for example, they make really, really sure uh, that nobody has easy, at least an easy way of hacking into it. Whereas the computers that you have, as long as you're uh, internet connected and you don't patch up your, your Windows uh, software, uh, you are much more at risk of getting hacked into and getting your data stolen. So cloud is actually a lot more secure than uh, having your own in-house server or having, having your own uh, desktop. Uh, one problem you may have is what's called the vendor lock-in. So if you start out with a particular vendor, uh, that is something that needs to be seen before you actually select a vendor, uh, they may lock you in in a way that uh, they, you can't migrate your data to a different provider. So if you ever want to uh, consider getting into the cloud for storage purposes, uh, but also for other reasons, uh, for, for programming reasons, then uh, think, think about first or talk to the vendor if the vendor allows you to move to a different provider if you see fit at some point or whether they're not to it. Okay, getting started to get into the cloud. Uh, to set it up for a small business is very, very easy and it's really free. Um, that is using Google Drive. Now, for, for most of you, whether you're a business, whether you're a business or an individual, you will have uh, already a Google account. Normally, when I have a class, uh, I ask for people to raise their hands if they do not have uh, a Google account. And no hands go up. So everybody has some kind of a Gmail account or anything else. Uh, so if you have a Gmail account, you already have automatically access to your own Google Drive uh, with a Gmail account. But from a business for a business, uh, it is fairly easy to do. Uh, what I would do is I would set up a business email, something like yourcompany at gmail.com. With that, you will have automatically a Google Drive account created for you, which you can use as data storage. Uh, you get up to 15 uh, gigs free for data storage. Uh, if you need more, then you have to pay as you go. So if you can scale this up. But uh, now one way of you know, sort of um, getting around this is you could also set up Gmail accounts for, let's say, mycompany.finance at gmail.com and another Gmail account, mycompanyname.hr at gmail.com. That way you have multiple uh, drives, one for finance, one for HR, one for other things that you may need. So that's one way of uh, scaling up basically for free. Uh, you can go up to, uh, to, as I said, 15 gigs. If you need anything more, then um, that is fine. Any file that, can, that is in your Google Drive can be shared with anybody in the world or just select. Now, uh, let me go to that, uh, that part of plan organization of folders. Well, you need to plan first as to what you're trying to do. Now, the idea is to move from those ugly steel cabinets uh, that only selected people can uh, have access to, and which cannot be accessed right now, uh, to something that is accessible on the cloud or to everybody in the world, potentially to your colleagues or to clients or to customers or whatever. Uh, so you got to think about this first, how you want to structure that. Uh, that takes a bit of planning. Uh, once you have that, then you can start by converting your, uh, your current files from a steel cabinet by, by simply scanning them. Uh, 
into PDF files and then compress them. Well, it's a good idea to compress files. There are online compression engines. So once you have a PDF file from your, uh, it was still coming in. Okay, sorry, I'll get back in a second. Um, so get the ping pong. I'm not sure if you can hear this, I hope not. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the Google Drive, so I wanted to get to that. Uh, so you, you can simply convert your, your physical files by scanning them into, uh, using a scanner into a PDF format. A PDF format, sometimes it's a bit bloated. Uh, so you can go online. Uh, there are many compression engines for PDF. So you can load up your PDF um, that you have created. Uh, these compression, on, online compression engines will make it smaller, and then you use a lot less uh, space in the storage itself. So it takes you a lot longer to fill up those 15 gigabytes. Uh, another thing is also to convert your files from any Microsoft Office files to uh, Google Drive files. So Google has its own version of uh, Microsoft Word, which is called Google Docs. It has its own PowerPoint uh, version. It's called Google Slides. This presentation that you're currently looking at, that is made with uh, Google Slides. So I don't use PowerPoint, I use Slides. And it is cloud-based. This, this presentation is not hosted on my computer. It is hosted again on the cloud. So I can go anywhere at this moment uh, in the world. As long as I have access to the internet, I can run this presentation, not only from my laptop, as I'm doing right now. I could also do it from my, uh, from my smartphone. I don't have to carry a memory stick. I don't have to carry anything. So that's really the nice thing with, with cloud storage. Uh, so it's a good idea to convert your files from a Microsoft version into a Google Docs version or Google Sheets version or whatever it is. Uh, because they don't count towards your storage. So whatever you write in Google Docs does not count towards your 15 gigabyte. So you can write uploads of stuff in Google Docs and uh, it's, you're not going to be charged for it in terms of storage. So that's a nice thing to do. Uh, share relevant folders, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, so you can share individual files like what I do with uh, the presentation on my Google Drive that you can have access to. Uh, but you can also share folders, you can share your whole drive with others if you wanted. So multiple people can work on the same project. So let's say hypothetically that now, uh, as a company you set up just one Google Drive uh, for the whole company and you have one folder for finance, one folder for HR, uh, one folder for whatever customer inquiries or whatever you want to set it up. Now, uh, people who work in finance with you, uh, they should have access to other documents within the finance folder but maybe they don't need access to the HR folder. So uh, other colleagues in finance, you can give them specific access to folders within the finance folder, but not within the others. Uh, the big boss, he may want to have an overview or she may want to have an overview of what's happening. So the big boss can have access to all files and folders that are in storage. So you can be really, elect, uh, really selective. Maybe you have an intern who, um, doesn't need to look at all the stuff, only very, very selected ones, uh, maybe how to make coffee and whatever. So you give the intern only access to a particular file that has your preferred coffee recipe on it. So it makes it very, very uh, easy to allocate uh, resources and allocate access to it. Now the last thing I want to talk about is SAS, that stands for service, uh, so, sorry, software as a service. Um, that means that your programs, for example, like uh, Google Docs, Google Sheets, which is the Microsoft Excel uh, equivalent, uh, Google Slides, which is the PowerPoint equivalent, they all run on the cloud. Uh, so you don't have to buy a disk uh, like, you, like, like you did in the past. You don't have to buy a disk, a uh, pirate disk somewhere or a, long, a real one for proper money um, and, and load it onto your computer. Uh, to install, let's say, your Microsoft Office or your Adobe Photoshop or whatever else. Now you can do this just simply based on cloud. So there's no software to download. That means also you can work on much smaller computers. You don't have to buy a computer or a laptop that has massive storage capacity. The computer that this presentation runs off uh, has uh, I think 120 gig uh, solid state drive, which is 90% empty because I don't use any storage on my computer. I store everything in the cloud. I do all my work, like the, my writing of documents, uh, my presentations or whatever. I do everything in the cloud. So I can actually work with a computer that is much smaller, as long as it's set up to the internet. 
And that is called software as a service, uh, as a first step. Okay, I think that brings me to uh, the first part of the how to get into the cloud basically for free. Um, so if there are any questions, then uh, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself, uh, ask the question, and then please remute re yourself. Uh, otherwise, uh, if, if 50 people talk uh, at the same time, it's like a wet market, so it's very difficult to. So if any questions, please let's go ahead and shoot as your chance. Yeah, so now's your chance. Um, well, Frank shared with us uh, how to use uh, the, Google, uh, the cloud um, to, to save some of our documents, uh, especially for smaller companies, you can use that uh, for free. Um, there's one person here who is uh, Chia P. Ho. Uh, you have a question? Or anybody has a question, you can uh, ask Frank now. Okay, don't be shy. Yep, or else uh, you can have, uh, you can just put your question uh, in the uh, chat, then uh, I will uh, probably uh, raise the question to Frank. Otherwise, uh, uh, Frank, I think you can continue. Okay, then. The second uh, part, yes. Okay, that's right. great. Then I continue. Okay, going online, that's the second part I want to talk about. Um, so that's now I mentioned briefly uh, software as a service. Uh, this is. Uh, so by going online, uh, doing your doing your work, basically your work processing and everything online through the cloud. Um, this is now going online with your business. Uh, so now going online for a business means different different things than from the user. Um, I still work with uh, a number of uh, small companies that still send out uh, printed prospectus to their client. Uh, every half year, they. Uh, have something created, they have it printed on paper, they put it in an envelope, and they send it to their client as a printed catalog. Uh, and that's really dinosaur age right now. There are lots of disadvantages of that. First of all, it cuts down a lot of trees. It costs a lot of money to have it printed and shipped. And I know for, from, all, from my own experience, whenever I receive a printed catalog in the mailbox, I look at it and say, hmm, interesting, and then I throw it away. Uh, there may be some uh, some departments and companies that file it for future use. But by right, whenever they do their spring cleaning, they also throw it away. So most of the time, these printed catalogs have been thrown away. Um, so it's a lot of money basically in the bin. The other thing is now, whenever your product is updated, something new comes out, or uh, sizes have changed, or a certain product is no longer available, this printed catalog is totally outdated. So it's not. It's obviously the worst of all solutions. Uh, an alternative to this is, which I've seen a lot as well, where people make that catalog, still do, uh, but put it into electronic format. So they digitize their printed, printed catalog by making a PDF file out of it. Uh, and then they can email it to people. Now, uh, if you were to receive emails from, uh, from PDF catalogs, would you, what would you do with it? Would you keep it or would you throw it away, put it into the bin? And from my own experience, most of the time, if this is a product that, for which I have no current use at this particular moment, I just bid it. I don't care. Because uh, if I need something at some point, uh, then I can still look for it. If I get information about a product for which I have no need at this stage, I will not keep that information. And that's probably true for most people, including businesses. So emailing a catalog to clients or potential clients every six months or three months is also a total waste of time. So the best way, because you reach them at the, at the wrong time, so the best way of doing this is actually uh, going online, uh, putting, uh, putting up a website with all the products and services that you have uh, described on the website. Doing this is very, very straightforward. We're going to talk about this in a second. Uh, but the, the benefits of this are, uh, are enormous. First of all, you can put a lot more information on your website. So let's say you're, you're selling uh, Selling handphones, or you're selling you're selling pens, pen like this. Um, if you were to put it into a printed catalog, it goes out. It shows the different color combinations that, that are available, and that's pretty much it. Uh, if you put the same pen on the website, you can actually make a short video out of it, of how it how it holds in the hand, uh, how it how it writes, what what the textures of the ink, and all these things. So uh, a video is something that cannot be printed. 
So you can put a lot of information that is important to a potential customer who's ready to buy something like this uh, to convince them to actually purchase your product. That is not possible with printed, and that is not possible with an email catalog either. So the information that you can put out, not, about your, not only about your company, uh, about your values, but also about your products and services themselves, is so, more, so much more comprehensive. The other thing is that now using a website as your, uh, as your catalog is that you reach people uh, anywhere in the world. I think I have. So you have a global reach uh, for this. So you're no longer limited to people who you send the catalog to or who you email the catalog to, uh, but to people anywhere in the world who may be interested in, in a pen for you, or whatever products or service that you have. So you have a much, much bigger reach. Um, if you do it properly, then it is very easy to update. So if a particular product is out of stock, then you can just simply remove it temporarily until you have it back. Then you click a button and then it appears again in your product catalog. Now, uh, if you have, let's say, this pen now also comes in blue and yellow and whatever, whatever I can easily update uh, the color combinations that are there. That's not possible with any other method. But it's also easy to scale. Uh, so if I have uh, a lot of products, uh, maybe nowadays I only start out with selling pens, but let's say this goes really, really well, uh, and I branch out into marker pens and felt pens and pencils and all this stuff, uh, so my business gets bigger and bigger, I can easily upscale uh, a website to my needs. But just to give you an example, later on I'm going to talk about uh, WordPress as uh, an easy way of setting up a website. Now, big companies like uh, the Washington Post, uh, like the BBC, they all run on uh, the same platform that uh, I recommend for you to use. So it's hugely scalable. Uh, this. And of course, once you have a website, it's fairly easy to market as well. There are free and there are paid versions to market. We're going to talk on Monday about uh, social media as a marketing tool, uh, where we'll come back to this. So it's fairly easy to get the word out uh, about the products and services that you have. The website that you, that you have with, with your products on it, but with also with, com with information about your company, that serves sort of as a central hub for all the others, for everybody who comes in and is interested in uh, what you have. Uh, so you have a massive reach all over the world. You can very easily update it, and you can very easily set it up. That's going to be the next slide here, hopefully. Uh, to set up a website, it is virtually free. There are a couple of things that you need to do, uh, but it is, it is virtually free uh, as a start. The only thing that you need and that is actually costing you money is the domain name and hosting of your website. Uh, domain name is not every website by, by uh, definition is just a string of numbers that is able that computers are able to read. So it is not friendly to humans to remember. I can tell you the the uh, URL the the actual URL to my website. Doctor, there's actually something like one seven eight dot one six eight dot zero zero seven dot zero zero one. Nobody in the world is going to remember that. I just make that up. Uh, so nobody in the world is going to remember it. So there is uh, a service that you can. Uh, that you can have where this number is converted in something that is memorable. So in my case, that number that I just said, whatever the real number is, is converted into drfrankpeter.com. Um, that is a domain name that you buy based on the number. That will cost you about, I don't know, uh, 10 US dollars a year, something like that. Um, then you need hosting. Hosting is again, uh, somewhere where you leave your website. You could theoretically put your own website on your own server, on your laptop that you're currently sitting in front of. You can make your website there. You hook your computer up to the internet uh, and you can set it in a way that everybody else in the world can access your website on your computer. Of course, the storage on your computer is limited. The computer has to be on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, you have to maintain it and all this. It is a lot of work uh, and it is very risky in terms of the power going out and so on. So an easy way of doing this is to rent space on somebody else's server. So in my case, my websites, all my websites are cloud-based as well, but you can also rent physical server space um, where somebody else takes care of all this stuff. So I don't have to worry about uh, whether there are new software updates uh, uh, needed for my, for my server. I don't have to worry about whether my server is online, whether the power goes out and all these things. Somebody else will take care of it. And that will cost you, give or take, about, let's say, five US dollars a month. Give or take. So those are the only costs that you have in running a website. Everything else after that is free. Um, 
as you can see from the picture here, I highly recommend WordPress. WordPress is a free, uh, what's called content management software. Uh, it is freely available once you have your own domain and hosting, you can install it. Uh, most hosting providers provide this for free anyways. Uh, and you can buy, uh, so you can add uh, lots and lots of uh, functionalities into it, separate functionality. So one of the functionalities is e-commerce, for example. So you can add, uh, you can add contact forms in it, you can add subscription forms on it, you can do video players in it. Uh, no, you name it, you can probably get a plugin or some added, added functionality into the WordPress template. It's very, very easy to do. Uh, uh, a child can do it. There's a slight learning curve, but it, it is very, very easy to, to, to set up. And I'll explain this in a second. Uh, one of the plugins that is available for, uh, for WordPress is called WooCommerce. That's a fully fledged e commerce uh, plugin functionality. So you can have your online shop with shopping carts, with payment gateways, whatever you, the whole with bells and whistles you can have uh, on your WordPress site for free. The only thing you need to do is upload your products, upload your descriptions, uh, and so on. You can upload product description, uh, products also as videos if you like. So it is super easy to do, very easy to learn. There are tons and tons of tutorials if you get stuck uh, on YouTube. Uh, but now, as long as you know how to write a document in Word, in Microsoft Word or Google Docs, if you're a cloud person, uh, now to underline stuff, to bold stuff, to change the font size, as long as you know how to do this, you can build a website on WordPress. It is that easy nowadays. So you don't have to hire uh, any web developer. You don't have to contract this out to others and pay lots of money for it. You can do this uh, internally. If you don't find anybody in-house who can do this, uh, Ask your kids or your grandkids. They probably uh, can point you in a direction. For for business owners here in the audience, you can also ask uh, students. Well, some students, but I, I don't know, business students, whether they know this, uh, but computer science students, they will definitely know this. Uh, just approach university, ask whether you can get contacts of the uh, certain faculty, computer faculty, for the undergrad students, uh, and just point this out. Now, here I'm going to pay you 200, 200 ringgit, 300 ringgit. For you to set me up WordPress, and you get a lot of takers for that. So you can do this in the cheap uh, if you don't want to do it yourself. It is, as I said, it's highly scalable. So you can, even if you come to a stage where you have like millions, millions of products, uh, WordPress is still your platform of choice. Uh, you can scale this until level. The only thing that you may need to change is your hosting. Uh, so that means may need to be scaled. As I said, my hosting is cloud-based hosting. So I pay as you go. So if I all of a sudden get tens of thousands of visitors. Uh, then my host will automatically scale and build me for that. And when my visitors go down to the usual five a day, um, then it will scale back down and I only pay a fraction of the amount. The other thing also is that, that people are worried about uh, WordPress, is it safe? And it's probably one of the safest platforms because so many people work on it. Uh, WordPress is open source. So many people work on the platform itself and on the plugins uh, that many people scrutinize it and try to find ways to break in just for learning purposes. And once, they, once they find anything, then they will write some extra code to catch up any leak that there might be. So it is not only easy to set up, uh, not e it's easy to scale, and it is also very safe and secure too. And it's free, except the initial setup cost for domain name and hosting. Everything else after that only costs you your time. And of course, your willingness to learn something uh, to set this up. So there's really no excuse to uh, not go online even if you don't have well, tons and tons of products to sell, even if you have only one product, uh, it is still worthwhile to go online because you can show much more about one product than you could do in just having a prospectus or one page sheet. Uh, you can also direct people, if you go, let's say you go to trade shows, uh, you can direct people to your website right there, right now, rather than giving them a stick. I go to a, quite a number of trade shows for, for different business that I have, and you know, some vendors give me a, a little pen drive. And they say, here, all our products, all our catalogs are on the pen drive, and they think they are so advanced. Uh, this pen drive I take, I say, thank you. I never use it uh, because I'm very worried about viruses on that, on that pen drive. A simple way to infect my computer is you put uh, a virus on a pen drive, you give it to me, uh, saying there's some important information on it, I click on it, and I infect it. Uh, now, having a website, having a catalog on, uh, on your website, that does not, uh, that, that uh, risk for me does not exist. So I'd be happy to look uh, through all your products, through all your catalogs, and see if there's anything of interest. So it's a lot safer for the user as well. 
Um, so that's a security part. Uh, so there's really no excuse not to do it. Uh, but as I said, even if you have just one product, uh, put it online, get people to, to view it, now put as much information on it as you need fit. Any updates can be done immediately and very easily just through a simple interface that looks like Microsoft Word. Um, you can add in your company details, your company values, and you can update it as you go, as you like. You can add pictures in it uh, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, whenever you have some time. So there's, uh, there's no excuse actually not to do. So that's, I think that concludes the, uh, the first or the part for the uh, getting a business online in a nutshell. I already overshot my time, I know that. Uh, so if you are a small and medium-sized business, so if you need any, uh, any help with it, uh, don't fret, no help is on the way. So I can I'll be able to help you with uh, both the processes and the strategies for this. Um, just either get in touch, I have it on the next slide, or visit uh, the website, the, the link below, uh, for some extra info. I do uh, bring out uh, regular tutorials uh, and some webinars on, any of, on some of these topics that you might find useful, they're generally free. Uh, so if you sign up for the mailing list that is on the website, then uh, I can get you informed as to what's happening. And then last but not least, these are my contacts. So if you want to get in touch by email, that's how it works. But my preference would be that you get in touch uh, with me through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is obviously a social media platform that you may know. A uh, great way to hook up with like-minded people in the, uh, in the similar business vertical or same business vertical that you have and exchange information. So I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. I spend pretty much no time on Facebook uh, because I rather learn something new from other LinkedIn connections than uh, get entertained on Facebook by some cat videos. That's a personal choice. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Have I have a slide there. No, okay. Then uh, if there are any questions, then uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself, uh, ask the question or use uh, the chat, if you want, uh, ask your question and then uh, you can see maybe, I can see whether I can answer it or maybe somebody else in the audience can answer it. Yeah, uh, Frank, thank you very much uh, for sharing with us. Uh, there are actually two questions uh, from the previous, the earlier uh, this sharing is about the cloud. Okay. Yeah, I will, I will put it now in the chat so that you have a clearer picture. It's actually from uh, Tai Jailer. Um, it's like the question is um, how to activate cloud so that is, um, I, I don't know um, Jala are you um, a him or she I'm not sure so um, uh, that's your question Jala right um, it's about how to activate cloud so that's the question for you Frank um, does it make sense the question if you can uh, yes fine? yes yes the, the question makes makes very much sense how to activate so the uh, the introduction that I gave uh, using Google Drive as a cloud service, there's nothing to activate. It's already done for you. So the, as long as you have a Gmail address, uh, then you already have uh, Google Drive. You can, you can go to, let's say you use a Chrome browser. If you use the Chrome browser, uh, in the top, what is it, the top right corner in your Chrome browser, there will be something that looks like a checkerboard. So, uh, nine dots or right, arranged in lines of three dots, three dots, three dots. If you, if you tap on that, uh, the menu gonna uh, pop down and uh, Google Drive will be on that menu. So you click on it and there you are, you have it, that's yours. Uh, you can then move your files in it, you can create new folders, you can upload your existing files from your computer into it uh, one by one uh, and so on. So you can really play around with that. With that automatically, you also have access to uh, software as a service, so you have access to Google Docs, uh, Google Sheets, Google Slides, and uh, some others that you might find useful. Uh, that all comes with it. So there's really nothing you have to buy, nothing you have to do. Uh, the only thing you need to have is a Gmail account, and that's it. You can also download it uh, from the App Store if, you have a, if you're a mobile person, so there's Google Drive available for uh, Android phones, and I believe it's also for iPhones. Um, that's basically it. If you are, okay, so that is the easy form, the easy way. If you are uh, a larger company, then of course Google Drive is not enough for you. And you have to have something that is bigger. Uh, that you have to purchase. So then you have to go to uh, a vendor, for, for example, Google. So Google has its own Google Cloud. Uh, Amazon has uh, their own cloud service. Microsoft has uh, Microsoft Azure. 
uh, there are a few others available that, that do this. I wouldn't go with the, with the small players, I would go with the big players because they're normally more reliable, I think. Um, so they're depending, they have, they have their local uh, retailers here, their local sellers here in Malaysia as well, you get in contact with the vendor, get a quote, and so on. What happens normally there is that they have to activate you first. So you have to decide what kind of package you want, uh, they'll activate you for it, and then uh, you get access. You get a dashboard like what you would for Google Drive, you get a similar dashboard uh, where you can move your files from your computer into uh, the, let's say, Microsoft Azure Cloud or the AWS Cloud or whatever it might be. So in terms of dealing with it, it is very easy. As long as you can move files from one folder to another folder, you can work the cloud. There's really no more scalable you know, uh, than this. Uh, so for small, for small uh, companies or individuals who would drive is more than enough, uh, for bigger companies, you have to contact the vendor. Uh, in terms of payment, quite often it is what's called a pay-as-you-go service. So if you lose very little resources uh, for a period of time, then you pay little. If you use more resources for some reason, then you pay more. So it is, it's not a fixed cost every month. It is really a pay-as-you-go service, uh, which is just, just to give you an example of how this will work. Um, if you, if you go to, let's say, Google Drive, uh, and you scale this up, so your 15 gigs is not enough for you, you have to use a bit more, then it's like, uh, yeah, so then, then you pay a fixed cost, but that, that stays like that, because you increase your storage. Even if you delete files, you still have to pay that monthly amount. But if you go for uh, any, uh, let's say, a public cloud, um, then you only pay for what you need. So if you remove certain, certain files from your cloud storage, then, and you use less storage, then you pay less for it. Oh, sorry, I was a bit long-winded. I hope yeah. that answered your question. Yes, if I can interrupt you, Frank. Um, you have a few more questions. Uh, if you look at a chat group, uh, this is from uh, Tan Chi Xiong. Uh, Doctor, hi, Doctor Frank. Uh, we all, as we all, um, as all of, as we all know, collaboration is quite important since we are moving all our work online. Can you recommend some online collaboration tools to ease out our work in daily routine in SME? Uh, in my past experience, I only recognize Notion, so the Monday.com both are quite nice. Uh, quite are nice, but they're quite expensive as well. Ha <laughs> ha. So what do you think? Yeah, I like the ha ha part. Uh, I, also, I also don't like the expensive part. Now I'm, uh, if I can get something something that is good and low cost or free, I'd rather go for that. Now for collaboration tools, uh, as I mentioned, the cloud, that's really your collaboration tool. Uh, so for any files, so let, let's, say, let's say you and I were to work on a proposal. And uh, now in the olden days, what you need to do is, now I, maybe I write a draft uh, and then I email it to you. And you go through it and say, well, I don't like this, I don't like that, you edit it. Then you send it back to me. And I said, well, I don't like that part. It doesn't sound good. So it goes back and forth. It takes forever. Uh, if you do this with the cloud, uh, we put that document. So I, maybe I write a draft in the cloud. And you can basically watch it as I write it. Uh, so you can, you can see what it is. You can do your own edits in real time. I can see those. Well, maybe your edits show up in, in green. My edits show up in red. And then later on, we can discuss which one we want. So we can have that proposal done in 10 minutes. So that is the advantage. So uh, cloud-based, uh, whether it's Google Drive or any other, I mean, I'm not married to Google. I'm not, uh, I'm not a shareholder either. I, have not really, uh, I don't get any monetary benefits from Google. Uh, it's just something that I use and that, uh, that I'm very comfortable with. So for, for collaborative purposes, uh, that is, that is a, that's a great thing to have, uh, the, the cloud itself, cloud storage, to share files and others, to work together on different things, uh, now, Zoom, uh, Zoom is free, the one that you're currently using. It's free for up to four people. And you can have meetings only for, I think, up to 40 minutes. Uh, so I have a license for it uh, where I can keep on talking 24 hours a day, but it's limited to 100 people for this particular license. That costs me 15 US dollars a month. So it's also very affordable. Uh, and this is a nice tool as well. Uh, if you have a smaller group, now Zoom itself has uh, a whiteboard in it. So I can actually draw something. I can type something. At the moment, I show you a screen that you can see at the moment at the, uh, at the back. Well, that is, that is the screen sharing, but well, I can switch this off. Um, let's see what's going to happen. Okay, so now I, I've switched off that screen. Uh, but I also have, if I wanted to, uh, 
um, a white part here. Let's see. Um, okay, never mind. Uh, it's, I have to re-enable re that. Some of, some of the stuff has to be disabled. Uh, I have a whiteboard, so I can I can uh, bounce back and forth ideas as well. I can share my screen with you. Uh, so if I work on something at the moment, I can show it to you wherever you are, you are in the world uh, as a collaborative tool. If there's a graphic design, or whatever, and you can then say, "Well, I don't like that green. I like the, I like the red better," and that's all. And then I can work on it in real time, and you can do this as well. So all these things are free or almost free tools um, that you can use. If it's just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Zoom, it's free. It's only if you have a bigger group of more than four people or you want to have uh, a meeting lasting longer than 40 minutes. Even if we have, let's say the two of us, we have a one-to-one -one meeting uh, that is sort of with a free Zoom, which is longer than 40 minutes. After 40 minutes, we're gonna lock, we get locked out, and then after that, we just lock back in. So we have a 10 second delay in there where we don't see each other. And after that, we have another 40 minutes to go. So it's really not something that is uh, prohibited. Um, okay. did, did that uh, I can interrupt you there, Frank, yeah. for sure. just a minute. Yeah, um, now it's already, uh, I'm very conscious of the time. It is eight minutes past three. Uh, if any of you who feels that uh, you, you have some other engagement, please feel free to leave the, the meeting. Otherwise, please just stay on because we have uh, quite a few more questions. Um, if you can just wait, please wait for a while more. Otherwise, um, uh, we will continue with the questions. All right. Uh, Frank, there's one more question here. Um, uh, if you look at the uh, chat, it's, by, it's from Eric. It's also about cloud. Uh, could, you read, could you read it to me? Yeah. Now, why use a cloud uh, can reduce the disk uh, of storage in computer. If we think file, uh, for example, documents uh, to cloud the files, we get, we still, we still be downloaded in the disk, right? Uh, okay, let me see whether you un, you, un, you you understand the question, yeah? Mm, I know, I know what he means. I know, I know, I know, okay, okay. I know, I know what the what the question means. Um, so the, the thing is, so um, let's say I write, uh, let's say I write a word documents. So let's say I have a computer. I have Microsoft Word installed on my computer and I write a Word document. So it is all on my computer. And then I shift this document to uh, my Google Drive. Then it exists in duplicate. So one, the original, one is not, still original, no fake. Uh, one version is on my computer, the other version is in my Google Drive. Now, if I delete it on my computer to save some space, it is still on the Google Drive. So when I go to my Google Drive, I double click on the icon for that document, that particular document, it shows up on my computer, but it is still stored on Google Drive. So if I do any amendments on it, let's say I edit it, uh, there's no need to even click a save button, it's automatically saved on the cloud. That is what's called uh, software as a service. So the software, the, the word editing software runs in Google Drive itself. It does not run on your computer. So it does not, you don't have to have Microsoft Word installed. Uh, you don't have to, by right, keep the file. So whenever, in, in a scenario um, where I, uh, let's say I had a lot of files on my computer and that slowed on my computer. Uh, what I did was I pushed all these files and folders to my Google Cloud. And then I deleted it on my computer. So that freed up a lot of space. My computer is a lot faster. Um, Whenever I need any of these documents, I can go to my Google Drive and look at it there. It is no longer stored on my computer. It is now stored someplace else. I have no idea where it is. It is the cloud, whatever that means. Uh, so it is, it, is, it is some physical location, obviously. It's not up in the cloud, uh, but I have no idea where it is. No clue. Uh, but it is accessible to me anywhere uh, I want, uh, as long as I have an internet connection. So did that answer, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but whatever you want. So if you look at the document in the cloud, it stays in the cloud. It is just visualized to you. It's not downloaded. Okay, so I hope that I answer your question, Eric. Okay, um, okay. so if any more questions, Eric, if you're not clear, you can please write in the chat room. Uh, but at the moment, there's one more question here, uh, Frank. Uh, this is from Aisa. Uh, so Aisa said, I have a question. Uh, often SMEs uh, fail to transform 
from conventional working environment to digital working environment. Uh, it is due mainly uh, because of the high illiteracy rate among the employees and uh, lack of agility among employers. Uh, from your perspective and given your broad experiences, what would be your, the, the advice for your clients? Uh, suppose you need someone as such. Uh, if you meet uh, someone as such. In other words, how would you approach them? So uh, this question is also uh, supported by some other people who would also like to ask similar question. Does it make sense to you, Frank? Oh, that makes perfect sense. Uh, <laughs> this, this, uh, I love it. This, this, is, this really sums up a lot of the work that I do. Um, you, you, have, you have two parts. You have either a very inflexible uh, management that still lives in the, uh, in the old days, and you, have, you, can have that, you, you can have a workforce that is very much pushing for it, uh, for the transformation part, to become more digital, uh, and often it's the management, because it's something that they don't understand. Um, they don't understand what digital means, they don't understand what cloud means, they don't understand what information sharing means, and if they don't understand something, they're not supporting it. So that is, that, is off, that is one of the main things that I have. Uh, from the work, workforce point of view, that they are um, digitally not literate, uh, that's, that's not always the case. Uh, and uh, those, those, are mostly, those are usually easy. They're, they're willing to learn. Uh, so let's, let's stay with the workforce first that you think is digitally literate. Now, many, uh, many people here in Malaysia have smartphones. Uh, and as long as you can, if you have a smartphone and you know, at least some apps, how to use some apps, you're digitally literate. Uh, and it also shows that you're willing to learn uh, how, how to use this. So training, simple training uh, would help a lot. Uh, I'm working with uh, a big uh, food, and, food and beverage manufacturer here, very large international one, uh, to educate some of their staff to get them a bit more uh, computer literate. But that's normally an easy, an easy job to do because they are, they are eager to learn this. Uh, it's very rare that you have people who say, well, this is, this is something for the younger generation, and I'm, I'm too lazy, I'm too old to learn this. This is very rare that this happens uh, from a practitioner point of view. However, this, this argument that now I'm too old for this, that you hear a lot in the upper echelons, at the higher, uh, the higher ranking staff. Uh, I, worked, I spoke with company owners. Uh, quite often those are Chinese-run companies, patriarchs run it, they're family-owned. Uh, they're all a bit older and I talk to them about uh, digital marketing and getting business uh, online and getting advertisements online and so on. And they refuse. They say, well, if I put money into an advertising, I want to go down to the mama and I want to pick up the newspaper, I want to open up the newspaper and I want to say, there's my ad. And if I, can't, if I switch on my computer, I can't see my ad. So I don't know if it's there. So that is their mindset. Uh, then the next thing they say is now, once my son takes over, once my daughter takes over, they can take care of this. Then my response normally is now, once your son takes over, your daughter takes over, your company may, long, may no longer be there because you are, you're being left behind. Uh, so it's, for, for the top echelons, it's a lot more difficult uh, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of fear level in there. Fear of the unknown, uh, fear of giving up control. Part of digital transformation is not but the main part of this transformation is not about technology. It's about our sharing of information, sharing of, uh, of data, collecting data and sharing of data uh, to everybody who has an interest in it. And uh, by sharing of data and people, people within talking to one another, that flattens the hierarchy in a company. That's, that's just how it is uh, by definition. So whoever is a manager or senior manager or whatever, they, lose, they have to give up some control. Uh, and that is often not something that they're comfortable with. That's, that's what holds them back. So it is really up to them, the top level management, the C-suite, uh, that has to put the foot down and say, uh, you as managers or senior managers, you have to drive this and you have to report to me uh, the progress on it and then put some pressure on those. And then you know, coming with the, the, the boots on the ground are fairly easy to take care of. Uh, so it's, it's a mindset change that comes first. Before you buy any equipment, uh, any new shiny computers, uh, it's a mindset change that has to come in first. That's the difficult part that comes with it. I don't know if that answered that question. If not, then please uh, let me know. Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, Frank. Uh, there is uh, there's one more question. Um, um, by Yiting, um, it says that um, Yiting enjoys how you address on training and education, 
um, by say educating them. So I'm not too sure who you refer to as them, the employer or the employees. Uh, but uh, I did like to ask uh, um, about how we do this uh, amidst uh, the pandemic, meaning that everybody is in the lockdown, MCO, when we cannot meet face to face. So how do we do this training and um, education online? Probably that's what the question is. Uh, yeah, online. I mean that's that's by now that's been given. Uh, but what what I mean by training and education, uh, that that's you will have people who are uh, comfortable with uh, digital, and you will have people who are not comfortable. That's that's uh, those are normally called digital natives uh, and digital immigrants, uh, and that has nothing to do with age. Now I've spoke to uh, old people uh, in their late seventies, sometimes eighties, uh, that are very um, very quick on their phone. They, uh, my, my dad, for example, when he passed away at 85, he, uh, he ordered his medication online, he booked his travels online, he paid the bills online, he used his phone for WhatsApp and Skype and all these things. He was digital native, although he was 80 over years old. But then you also have a few people who are young and, uh, and either don't have the opportunity or they don't have the interest or they simply don't want. And those would be slid into the immigrants. So it's not an age thing, it's really a thing of um, whether people want or not. And, but uh, all of these can be great. I mean, all of this is, uh, is teachable. Uh, you start out from the beginning for, for those who have no clue. Uh, the only thing that people need to know or need to have is the willingness to learn. If people say, I don't want to learn anything, then uh, those are often the lost case. Sometimes though, we've tried that with some of the HR departments I work with put some pressure on it, get some counseling. But if they're still stubborn, then at some point they're, they're gonna be phased out. And only then they, they realize that uh, it was a bad decision. So everybody can be trained. You know, I'm a, I'm a corporate trainer. Uh, there are many others around, uh, so that's, what, that's how we earn our living. Um, so everybody can be trained from the boots on the ground all the way to the C-suite uh, level. I do a lot of C-suite training. Uh, everybody, uh, as long as they're willing to listen willing to have an open mind and are willing to learn, it can be done, it's not an issue. There was one thing, then you said, oh yeah, how it's gonna be conducted. Uh, don't you love this online trainings, uh, online learning? It's not nice for a trainer, because for a trainer, uh, in, a, in a room, if I have a full room of people, uh, there's some energy there. So I, I sort of absorb some of that energy, which I really enjoy. Uh, here I talk to a camera, I can't even look, whenever I look to the screen, I look down. Uh, so I look at a camera that is that is up in front of me, so I don't even see the screen. Uh, so it's a bit boring for me. But uh, from a participant's point of view, there are no distractions. So there's nobody coming in the room, there's nobody uh, coming to a workstation, and then give, can you give me a, a pen, can, you, can I get this file from you, and so on and so on. So there are very little distractions for it. Uh, you can sip your coffee, you can sit there in your underwear if you like to. I shouldn't say that, but I have a shirt on top, I have actually shorts. I only wear shorts and definitely have a button. Uh, because nobody can see it. Uh, so that, that makes it a bit of more of a relaxed environment. So uh, online training is not as bad as uh, well, some people say it might be. It's a bit impersonal, uh, but it is still probably the, the new normal that we have to face. Okay, uh, Frank, thanks uh, for, for the uh, answer. Uh, but then, uh, this I think a thing was uh, trying to ask how do we convince the SME owners? So it's not too much about training or uh, about uh, exposing or educating the, the employees, but then now the challenge is uh, how do we convince the owners? Okay, the owners, uh, convincing the owners is one of the more difficult parts. Now, some are uh, very much for it, uh, others are very reluctant. I mentioned this earlier with the uh, patriarch that said, now, once my son takes over or my daughter takes over, they can, they can deal with it. It's very difficult to get into those people's head. Um, they will have to suffer first sometimes. I mean, that's really the worst case scenario. They have to suffer first and see that there's reduction in business. Uh, or they have to see that their competitors are doing, uh, going with the times, uh, uh, becoming future-proof, and they lag behind. Um, one of the things that's, uh, when I speak to SME owners or other business owners, uh, one of the, the few feedbacks I normally get, and one is they don't understand it. So then, it's, it's education, so I have to explain to them what it means, the digital transformation, um, what it can achieve for the company. Right? On Monday, we have another, uh, another um, part 
where I talk a bit about uh, remote working and gig economy. That is, that is one way of uh, SMEs to save money by saving on staff, on permanent staff. So the digital transformation, the whole purpose of um, a digital transformation is not to buy new shiny objects. It is to provide better customer service at the end at a lower cost. That's all it is. So the whole, the whole scenario of a transformation program uh, is not for the, for the transformation per se by itself. It is really to stay competitive. And competitive means you, know, you want to be seen by as many customers as possible. You want to sell as much stuff. And customers nowadays obviously have choices. So they, have, they can go online. Uh, if I want to buy it, I can go back to the pen. Uh, if I were to be a customer and I'm looking for a pen, I just go online. And I, I have, I don't know, tons and tons of websites that I can choose my pen from. And if your SME makes pens or sells pens and you're not there, then I'm not going to buy my pen from, from you. Uh, the other thing is that if I'm a customer uh, and there are 10 different vendors or 10 different people or 10 different companies online who sell this pen, identical pen, I will go for the cheapest option. So that's what customers are, including myself. I look for the cheapest option. If it's free, it's free, I take it. Uh, if, it's, if there are different prices, if it's the same item, I go for the cheapest price, simple as that. Uh, so that's what, that's what customers want. They want to have it easy and they want to have it cheap. And for a company, the digital transformation program is simply to optimize all their internal processes to make them more efficient so they can offer their products cheaper and to more customers. That's all there is to digital transformation in a nutshell. So this is something that uh, company owners have to understand. There is not necessarily a lot of money involved. Now I mentioned earlier, bringing your, for example, your collection of pens online costs you very little, uh, except some time, uh, some, some time for somebody to set it up. But in terms of money, it costs you very little. Putting uh, your files uh, online onto the cloud is also fairly cheap for a small company. Right. If, it, if you need more space, you pay more. Uh, but it is also fairly cheap. So it's not the cost that is prohibited. Um, no. So education, if I have an SME owner, uh, they have normally two things. One is, no, I don't know what it is, and it's going to be too expensive. And both of these things are not true. Uh, I tell them what it is and why it, needs to be, why it needs to take place. It is really to make your business processes more efficient and more cost effective, cheaper. So you save money, so you can offer your product at a cheaper price. The other thing is to uh, make it easy for your consumer to buy your product or service. And for that, you need to be online. But if you ask around, uh, if you do a bit of market research yourself as a business owner or uh, anybody else, if you ask around, now where do you buy your stuff, especially now during SEO, people buy online. I have a neighbor here where I live. Uh, she never went online. She told me, or she told, or she told my wife. Uh, she never bought anything online. Now during MCO, she buys everything online. No, toiletries, food, you name it, she buys it online. She bought some furniture online. This time. She really got a hang of it. Uh, so furniture shops, uh, brick and mortar furniture shops will lose out on this. People who sell furniture online will gain from this. So in order to, as, uh, to address an SME owner or a decision maker, those are my, basically my, my two ways of getting into their head. Yeah, uh, Frank, uh, thank you again. Uh, I'd like to just ask you, this is a personal question. I'm just wondering if, let's say, um, if you want to convince um, the SME owners, does it make sense, if, let's say, I, I just choose to go on some website like Lazada and uh, Shopee to just market my goods or my products? What do you think about that? Um, that's, that's also something, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very, very question, so I get to ask quite a bit as well. Uh, now, there are, there are two thoughts to it. Um, of course, no, Shopee, Lazada, and the likes, they have, uh, they reach a lot of people. Everybody goes there and, and looks for it. But now, let me ask you, uh, if you wanted to buy a camera, but you're not quite sure what you want to buy, and if you go to Shopee, for example, or to Lazada to look for cameras, you'll, you'll be bombarded by, I don't know, 20,000, 30,000 camera, uh, camera listings there. It is just too overwhelming. So if you know exactly what you want in terms of camera, then uh, you may go to Shopee or Lazada or the equivalent or any other, any other platform. So the more, the problem is that if you are a seller of cameras, your product is diluted out. 
So if I, let's say, I sell pens, uh, so will be hundreds of others, including lots of uh, vendors from China who probably sell this pen uh, cheaper than I can. Uh, but for so I be I be one of many. Uh, so I be diluted out uh, as a as a provider as a seller, uh, and it, I'm difficult to be found. That is one thing. The other thing is for every pen I sell, I have to give Shopee or Lazada or whatever platform a commission. So they um, they collect the money on my behalf. If somebody buys the pen, they collect the money uh, and then they deduct their commission, and I get the rest paid in my to, to my account. So they obviously take a bite out of it. The alternative to this is uh, I can set up my own website. I can market my website with all the pens that I have uh, and, get, and then use, for example, social media or any other platform, if other platforms paid or free, uh, to drive traffic to it of people who are interested in buying a pen. Uh, there is no more distraction. All the pens on that website are mine. There's nobody else there. So people, can't, people don't compare. Uh, if I do this right, and I put uh, proper, again, at the point of education, I put proper description as to how good this pen is, uh, what it can do, what it cannot do, I'm honest about it, maybe I have a short video of how to use the pen, uh, then I will create uh, a kind of trust to a potential buyer. That trust is not being developed uh, on one of those mall platforms like Shopee or Lazada. It's just you know, grab and buy, uh, grab wooden shopping cart and buy. that's it. Otherwise, on the website, you have a bit more uh, trust that is being developed. So if I can do this right uh, with, a, with an online presence, I can actually sell this pen for twice the amount I would sell it on Shopee. Because I have created the trust uh, on my website. People know if the pen doesn't work, they can return it. If they have questions about the pen, they know who to ask uh, and so on. That is often not possible uh, on a platform. So if I have, let's say I buy a pen on, on, on Shopee, and it doesn't work, or I don't know how to use it. I don't know who to ask. Now, if that Shopee has its own helpline, obviously, but now if I call to Shopee uh, service, to the service line and ask them, can you tell me how to use this pen? They also don't know. Uh, so they would then have to ask the vendor. The vendor probably doesn't care because I still don't have to and so on. So it's totally different thing. If I want something uh, where I need some help with, but I'm not quite sure whether this is good for me, normally those are higher value goods, um, I would go to the individual website. And I don't have to scroll around a lot. I, I know I go to a website that is properly done where I can ask questions and then buy from them as well. Because I know I get the after sales service as well. If I know exactly what I want and it's something that is not out of the world, uh, like a cheap pen, I will go to Shopee and buy it there. Because it's cheap. I save some money. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I, I figure if you, yeah, through that, probably you get better CRM customer relations uh, management if you are doing have your own website. Yes, yes. Um, and, and also to, uh, to, to go back to Yi Ding's uh, question about how to uh, convince um, the SME owners, I'm just thinking if we as the, we, I'm talking about me, uh, we, the younger ones, if we want to, uh, try with WordPress um, uh, ourselves to design one for ourselves uh, with some of the products of the company and, and, and try to impress our boss uh, with what we can do with WordPress. Probably that will be more effective. I don't know. This, this is just something that I'm um, thinking. Sure, uh, sure that can be done. WordPress has two versions. Uh, one that The one I mentioned earlier is what's called self-hosted. Um, so that would be really your domain name. So my website that you can see below, uh, Dr. Fabida is also WordPress hosted. All my websites are WordPress based uh, and cloud hosted. Uh, so what you see is really the domain name .com uh, as the web address. For that, that I have paid for. I also pay for the hosting. It's a small amount, I mentioned this earlier. If you really don't want to pay any money at all, uh, WordPress also has a free version. But then uh, the, the name where it would be drfrankpeter.wordpress.org. So there still is that WordPress in there. You may have seen this for others as well. So some something something dot blogspot.com or something something dot blogger.com. Those are free hosted uh, platforms. They're free. Google also has this as uh, Google what's it called? Um, Google Sites. So they also have you can build a free website on uh, Google Sites, but it will still have the word Google somewhere in there. So it's 
if I'm a customer and I would come across a, a, a business that tries to do, uh, to try to sell me some goods, and I see that they are on a free hosted website, then I think, well, they're quite cheap, Charlie. Uh, if they can't even afford a few dollars uh, a month to host the website, then uh, I'm not sure if I can trust them. So that's a drawback to that. But you can, you can build something on, uh, let's say, WordPress.org uh, for yourself. You can take a name, whatever you like, uh, and show it to the boss. Just to see, uh, this, that's how it, how it could be if we were to go real life. Uh, and then if the boss says, hmm, that's not too shabby, uh, let's go for it. Then you could transfer it to a proper hosted account uh, with your own domain name and so on. But it's a good start, yeah. Uh, use a free service uh, as a start, just to impress the boss, and then uh, move up once the boss says, okay. Yeah, Frank, if you can share with us, uh, like how much is it to subscribe to WordPress that uh, with that uh, your own domain name? WordPress is free. Uh, so it, it has no cost to it. What you need is you need to register your domain name. So in my case, it's drfrankpeter.com. I registered that domain name with uh, a naming service. The domain name service, there are plenty out there. So if I can recommend some, but uh, there are plenty out there. Go with the bigger one. Uh, like GoDaddy is a bigger one. Uh, I think mine is registered with GoDaddy. They're also fairly cheap. Uh, but GoDaddy only for the domain name, not for the hosting. They also provide hosting. But I don't host with them. They are pain in the ass with that. But they are, they are good uh, for domain names themselves. You can go to godaddy.com and type in whatever name you're looking for. And then GoDaddy will tell you that's available or not. Uh, and if it's available, it tells you how much it costs. So that's probably something like that. 10 US dollars a year, something like that. Then you need the hosting account. And hosting that I use is, uh, I use a different company. Uh, Google has its own hosting, but I could get it to work. Uh, Amazon has its own uh, cloud hosting, so I work with uh, I, I go with a different company uh, that does cloud hosting. That costs me, I think, about five five or six US dollars a month. But I, all my sites are hosted on that particular account, so it's just limit, not just limited to one website. It's uh, multi sites uh, in this case, so it's very affordable. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think now it's already half past three. Um, uh, shall we take one more last question, Frank? Sure, sure. I got nowhere to okay, go. Probably we, we can we can still take one more last question. Uh, and this question is uh, from someone who's really interested with uh, your conversation uh, this afternoon. Uh, she's still eating. Uh, so she has this question now. If you can look at the chat, I say, uh, sorry for extra question. I don't think you have to apologize for the question. Um, so her question is, while everyone is going online, I think uh, what's bothering is how to really bring traffic to our website, uh, like the WordPress, and how do we also manage our CRM as many SMEs are operating in, in their advantage of the geographical location. So, uh, yeah, so actually, and there are two questions embedded in one. So, uh, Frank, uh, would you like to take that question? Uh, sure. Uh, so the, the first part of the question is how to get, once you're online, uh, how to get traffic to it. That's a good point. Now you can have the most beautiful website in the world if nobody comes to it. Uh, no use. Uh, so we're going to talk about it Monday. So try to make time on Monday uh, and join us. Uh, I'm going to talk about social media marketing a bit. Uh, that will show a bit about um, how, to pro how to market products on social media, but also to use social media as a funnel uh, to come to your website. So I'm going to defer that to Monday. Uh, hope you can make it. If not, I uh, should also mention this. Uh, all these sessions are recorded. I haven't messed it up. Uh, they will all be recorded, uh, and uh, the uh, webinars will then be on the Xiamen University website somewhere, or on my website as well. So uh, if you miss on Monday, then uh, you can go to either Xiamen website on Tuesday or to my website on Tuesday, and it should be there. Now, the second part was. Um, How do we manage uh, CRM as uh, SMEs are operating in the advantage of geographical location? I think for traditionally SMEs, uh, they rely very much on location, which is a physical location, very much on that. So now you're talking about digital space. So the question is, how do we manage the SMEs, uh, the, the CRM, sorry. Okay, CRM, uh, because it's cloud-based, uh, you can have, okay, uh, a website, let me, let me just take a step back, sorry. Uh, a website, obviously, it's available uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all around the world. So if there's somebody in, let's say, in Germany, 
uh, interested in your, your products, uh, they may contact you. But uh, there are six hours time difference to it. Uh, so you need, so if they contact you, you don't have anybody there. Now, uh, one way of dealing with that would be a chatbot. So you, can, you can have, if it makes sense for the size of your company, you can train your own chatbot. Uh, otherwise, you can use something as simple as Facebook Messenger. Uh, as, as, as a very simple chatbot. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have, uh, so that's very easy to set up. So even, even if they message you as now, what would be like 2 a.m. in the morning here, and you, you are not on your computer to answer that question, uh, you would still have an automated response that would go out uh, to a potential customer telling them that uh, you're not at the computer at the moment. Uh, or it can answer simple questions, depends on how the chatbot has been trained. Uh, that's one thing. If you're a bigger company, uh, then you could hire people uh, in different time zones. So yeah, obviously there are uh, 12 time zones in the world, so you have uh, one here and one in 12 time zones. Uh, uh, sorry, 24 time, 24 time zones. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you have one one representative every eight time zones. Uh, so you have two others, one here and two others, and plus eight and minus eight, and uh, they can have access to all your product descriptions. Uh, through cloud, so you you keep all your your boilerplates, your uh, your product descriptions, whatever in the cloud. Somebody calls the uh, the agent in their area, uh, let's say in the US or wherever it is. That agent can just simply pull out the spec sheet and can answer that particular question that the potential customer has. So it is it will also allow you uh, to be, to go global. You don't have to hire a full time a full time agent. Now we can on the money. We also talk we're going to talk about about the uh, gig economy. Where you hire people on a per gig basis, so you could have a customer service agent sitting in whatever in California, and only pay that person on a per use basis. So that person could be your your face of your company uh, for U.S. customers. So you don't have to stay up middle of the night to answer that question. Uh, that's for customer relations management. If you uh, if you look for a more automated system, uh, again, if I go back to Google, uh, I use Gmail uh, for my CRM as well. Uh, I have two different Gmail accounts. One is for personal use, one is for business use. Uh, the business use, I have a CRM plugged in. Uh, there are extensions available for Gmail for customer relation management. You can look them up. Uh, there are a few available. I can't remember the name of mine. Um, but you can contact me if you want, and I can, I can give it to you. Uh, that, that allows me to uh, uh, um, group customers at uh, depending on the stages as to where certain projects are and so on and so on. So it's really a CI management, but for email in this case. Did that answer the question? Do you think did it answer your question? Did uh, Dr. Frank answer your question? I'm just wondering if you think he's still around. Um, it's okay. Okay, I think if uh, you think if you have any, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, she responded, she said yes, uh, thank you. Uh, it's already about 3.40, uh, 40 minutes past three. What we have done so far, uh, we started 10 minutes uh, past two. So we had uh, 50 minutes of um, sharing session and a 40 minutes of question and answer session. So I guess uh, people are more interested to ask uh, you questions. Um, I think, I don't know, I think the, um, the participant today seems to be a bit shy of asking questions uh, orally, but uh, definitely we have a lot of questions in the chat room. I think it is really good that uh, we have all these questions coming and we can learn, certainly learn more from uh, the questions, right? Uh, and get more clarification from the, uh, from the chat room. So from Frank as well. So I guess uh, we, we will uh, come to an end. We will end this session today. Um, and uh, let me see, um, I, Frank, uh, thank you for all the tips that uh, you shared with us today. Um, I am currently using uh, Google Drive and I like to, I like how you, you, you are mentioning the word free a couple of times, uh, which is really, really good because all of us like free things. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much for recommending some free tools for us to use, some practical tools for us to use. I've not tried Word, Word, uh, WordPress before probably because I don't have a business myself. So uh, probably if I need one, I would just have to explore if I need to have my own website and see whether it, it works for me. Right. Uh, so I hope everybody learned something uh, in this uh, webinar today. Uh, for 
next week, Monday, uh, Frank already uh, shared with you and also gave you a bit of teaser what he's going to talk about uh, next week. So uh, again, the two topics uh, next week will be on uh, how to utilize uh, remote working and the gig economy to save costs. So um, I guess this is very, very relevant to uh, SME owners, uh, how to save costs. I think that is a very, uh, a very relevant uh, topic to be discussing now. Uh, second thing is um, how to use free social media with a long lasting customer acquisition strategy. So some of the questions are already, uh, 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 Frank already tried to answer some of the questions, but uh, I guess um, next week on Monday, we will be able uh, to discuss a bit more. Right, Frank? Yeah, sure. definitely on Monday, I'm gonna talk a bit about, about those, those two other topics. Um, as you can see, there's a theme in there, it's either free or low cost. Um, that's, that's something that is quite, uh, important at the moment. Uh, many businesses are suffering, including myself and uh, training. What I do, corporate training, is also for many companies put on hold. Uh, so webinars is a great way of uh, passing time and uh, getting still something useful out there. So I hope I see you on Monday then. Okay, see everyone on Monday. Bye and uh, thanks for following us. See you again. Take care and uh, be safe.